Hello, and now present to you the wonderful joystick keyring pliers. So what inspired me to finally do a video on this lovely piece of engineering was Lucas Dole's recent video on keyring pliers, which you can see up here in the video card. So basically, what keyring pliers do is allows you to remove these paper inserts here. So basically, you have your metal keyring, your glass key top, and then the paper insert or disc underneath that onto which is printed the character that will be typed when you press said key. So generally there are two types of key rings. Uh, the first ones are those which have tabs, like so. And moving this guy back, you can get a better look. So basically those tabs hold this in together and ideally you would want a special tool that allows you to unbend all those tabs at once. And sometimes you'll find that even after those tabs have been brought out of the way, there'll still be a bit of an interference fit um, preventing you from fully pulling out these key rings and for that you'll still need a special tool or you'll just have a hard time trying to do it with a screwdriver or other device. Um, then the other type is those which only use an interference fit and no tabs. So you can see here, there are no tabs, it's all just a purely interference or friction fit. So as you would have learned from Lucas Dole's video, keyring pliers typically come in sets of two. One for removing the key and another for reinstalling it. That's because typically you need different parts for basically pushing the pushing on the glass and pulling off the keyring and then a separate assembly for pressing it back on. And additionally, you would have these plates that are attached to the bottom of the jaws, and those generally only accommodate certain diameters of keyrings. So for example, here we have 14.5 millimeter keyrings, and I believe these are mainly used in Royals as well as some other typewriter manufacturers. And then you have these shift keys, which are about around 18.5 or 18.6. Um, then this guy here, the Smith Premier 60, uses similar dimensions. But then, okay, yes, you can see here, if you're tr to try to use the Royal plate on the Smith Premier, these key rings might be too small. And then here, if you were trying to remove the key rings of a Hammond, um, this one's reasonably close, but again, it's not guaranteed to work perfectly. Then, keep on going to, for example, this German Mertz typewriter. Look forward to the video for that, uh, depending on where you're measuring. Either that or that. Here there's a much clearer difference where it would be too, the key ring would be too large. So 14.7, that's for Carmen. Similar for the Olivetti M20. And even with an America, Underwood here uses 14.64 millimeter key rings approximately, or 14.6. And finally, for these two machines to look forward to the videos for, 14.6, and yeah, this one's closer to the standard 14.5. But yeah, the general gist is that um, if you are trying to service um, more different types of typewriters with these more non-standard or just varied keyring diameters, then you're going to need a separate plate to accommodate each diameter. And yeah, that can get expensive um, since, yeah, have fun trying to find those out in the wild on eBay or whatnot, or they would just be expensive to machine. Now, what if I told you that there exists a single pair of keyring pliers that can both remove and reinstall keyrings of any diameter? In that case, it happens to be this wonderful thing, the joystick keyring pliers. So I got this guy off of an auction on German eBay for a mere 200 euros. 
Now, that may sound like a lot, but consider that just two weeks prior, a rustier instance of this exact same model sold for 350 euros. Um, I was actually the runner-up for that. Um, and what I think might have possibly increased the value of that instance was the fact that this backplate here, so your triple owl joystick logo, happened to have a double stamping defect. Um, now, I know for sure that that kind of defect would highly increase the rarity and hence value of coins, but I'm not sure if the same applies to typewriter tools. Uh, but anyways, I'm quite glad to have ended up getting this wonderful and much nicer condition one. Um, perfectly working. Well, had to do minor adjustment. Um, anyways, so basically you'll notice here that, firstly, this guy is bistable. Two positions. In the first position, this position, your plunger operates. So that conducts the role of the first pair that you'd typically use in the conventional keyring pliers. And just one of those, or in original condition, could go for like maybe 200 to maybe even 300. And then in this position, we have your key pressing or reinstallation and tab bending state. And again, those alone can go for 200 to 300, and if you want to, or if someone manages to list a pair um, complete with plates and whatnot, I can go for like 400, 600, maybe 800. So, yeah, 200 for all that functionality for any diameter is quite a bargain. Absolutely wonderful tool. As for using it, let us start with this machine where I'll be working with plain interference fit key rings. So the first thing I want to do is basically do this to ensure that it is in the key removal state as opposed to the key pressing state. So yeah, you can do this with one hand. If you do it like this, that's key removal. And then like this, key press. Remove, press. So very quick to do. I mean, of course you could just reach for your second pliers in the conventional case, but likewise, even with those conventional pliers, you might find yourself having to unscrew and turn around or swap the lower plate. And yeah, you have none of that with this tool. So again, key removal. Um, do note that if you quote-unquote dry fire this, um, ideally in order to reduce wear on this plunger, prevent it from going back and snapping. Otherwise, you'll have this situation. As you can see, and then we'll click. I mean, it's not that consequential, but yeah, just it's better to only actually press it when there's a key in there or something to lock the jaws. So here, I'm going to start like so. Now, as far as I can tell, this piece here is just some coated metal and has always been this hard. Um, typically, for conventional pliers, you instead have a soft piece. And I believe that this approach here is actually probably less prone to the breakage of these glass tops because you always have the same circle applying even pressure, whereas in the case of having an old pair where the rubber is still hard, you end up with um, like hard high points or sharp points and a failure to get a good distribution force, uh, exacerbating the risk of breaking the keys. So again, let's go here, make sure it's nice and level, and apply pressure, and you're good. So, yeah, this guy popped out. In this case, for the Smith Premier, there actually isn't any separate glass top. It's just some kind of, like, maybe cellulose 
lamination on top of the card substrate. And then we have the magic, which is uh, this exact same pair of pliers will also work for the shift key. So that's all because this jaw is spring-loaded. So again, nice and careful, make sure it's well seated, apply pressure, and comes off. Now technically in this case there was no glass to break. Um, in this case, yeah, I'm not going to clean it right now, but I do intend on doing so. Um, as you saw earlier, this was crooked, so I've just straightened it up. And yeah, that's what it looks like when it's all nice and clean. So now to reinstall the keyring, we just first place it on roughly. And now again, you want to use this grip here, pushing up to get into the pressing state. That. So, in order to remove it, we used these jaws, but now to reinstall it, we want to use this jaw. All nice and pressed. Same thing with the shift key here. Um, and yeah, if you don't like the one-handed grip, you can just manually, or use your second hand to push it into the removal state or back into the, well, reinstallation state and then removal state. Reinstall, remove. Okay. Okay. That's all good. Okay, and now for these tabbed royal key rings, we're going to want to do basically the same thing, except we need to make sure that these jaws are not in the same position as those tabs, because if they're on those tabs, then they won't be able to bend. They'll be blocking them from bending out, and you'll keep on pressing and applying force, and then your glass will break and you'll be sad. Um, so yeah, always make sure that these tabs are not on those tabs, so here you can see it bending nicely and cleanly. Absolutely no risk of breakage as far as I can tell. And exact same principle for the shift key here. Make sure that it's nice and stable, then apply firm pressure. All good. And then you can use an appropriate tool. I personally use hobby knives to help me pry that glass top off so you can clean this. Um, I've done so for this guy. Um, since, as you can see from the photo. This guy was a bit dirty, and I just went ahead and scraped away the troublesome parts. And also using uh, yeah, my 
would be a little too hard to remove this key insert, but without damaging it. But you get the idea. That goes back on. And then we can put our key ring back on. You might want to carefully bend these tabs out first so you can put it in. Okay, so I have that one back on. Now, again, we're going to push it out into the key pressing state where the plunger is not being pushed. Um, in this case, we might want to first put it in this state just to help get it to be fully pressed in. Okay. Okay, yeah, just press it down first. Now that it's in that state, we can align the tool. Okay, so align your tab benders with the tabs, let it close on, and apply firm pressure. As you can see, it's bending it nicely and also flattening it. So, with your conventional pliers, have to have a separate like bowl shaped plate and then you'd have to after doing just that basic step unscrew and turn around the plate in order to get to the flattening part but yeah here we do it all at once and as you can see it also works for the shift key and this time I'm actually was able to correct a small mistake with my operation of the tool so here I'm just doing a preliminary press and then just rotating the tool to get the tab benders in place. Oops, <laughs> don't worry, nothing broke. And we're all good. So as you can tell, this is an absolutely wonderful piece of kit. We are able to reliably and safely remove and reinstall key rings, um, in this case of different diameters also. So now let's do a deep dive into how this thing actually works. So first we want to remove this screw here, as well as these three and these three. I've set up this set screw here so that I can easily just pop it out like this and put it back as desired, but in some cases you might actually have to fully remove this piece. So now with that removed, we can see the working principle of how we get this bistable functionality. So first in the key ring removal state where the plunger is able to move, basically we have this pin here and is interfering with the top of this hole. And then the mere act of rocking it backwards into well, this state allows it to pass through the hole, preventing the plunger from being extended. So this main plate will still extend at the exact same time, but the plunger will stay behind. Okay, so now that we have these screws removed, we come to a relatively crucial step insofar that there's a spring in here that we do not want to overstretch. So basically, during your normal operation, this guy's getting pushed this far, and that stretches a spring, but we also end up stretching that while trying to pull this guy out. Um, so to avoid such, we first want to remove this plate. Um, yeah, that plate was originally sitting over 
here. Um, now that that's out of the way, you see that screw there? That's where that spring is mounted. Now, funny enough, I actually <laughs> completely ruined the original spring when I tried to brute force getting this guy to this part um, without first unlinking that spring. Absolute pain. Um, and yeah, as you'll see from the following photos, I failed at trying to restore said spring and ended up having to steal a spring from this Mertz here. And now the remnants of the original spring is sitting right over here, at least a truncated part of it. And that Mertz still works nicely. Um, so what that spring did was reset the line lock mechanism after you're pressing the margin or returning the carriage. Um, so, yeah, let's unlink that. Okay, so now that the spring is loose, we want to use some tool. Ideally, I would use my tweezers, but it keeps them going missing. Um, and yeah, we want to let that end there fall into the hole. Come on. There you go. So now that that's free, we can safely remove this assembly. There you go. Still have that spring here. And then some kind of mechanism that facilitates the stability. Oh, right, that edge there. That's how the two positions are facilitated. Then we can look inside this assembly here. So we have these springs, and those springs are what this plate was pressing onto. Those will just come off. Then you have our plunger. Should have been spring loaded. This guy here comes out and is what is responsible for closing the jaws. So there's an alignment pin at the bottom there, and these slots need to accept the jaws. So basically, as you can see there, that surface is pushing on the sliding surfaces and that in turn closes your jaw and also pushes forward this part the front plate anyways let's remove that oh okay uh, yeah, be careful about that since it seems like that spring is still stuck. Okay, now it should be safe. There you go. So, yeah, it pushes on those sliding surfaces with this beveled edge. Then, you can see here, those actual pieces and the respective leaf springs, or, oh, okay, yeah, distortion springs. And... This part here will also come out like so and have its own alignment pin. Uh, 
And now, when I pull this guy out, you'll be able to see the spring that I stuck into here. So this guy again was truncated and formed from the Mertz. And I did my best to basically make it a not exact replica other than a slight difference in the gauge of the spring. But yeah, exact same number of turns and replicating this form as closely as possible. And now for reassembly, first consider the position that these parts will take. So again, lamp pin. Um, I would personally have this piece face upwards because that slot is over there. Um, I might actually advise having a wire, a hook, to help you pull on this once we want to get it seated again on the screw that goes here. So basically you just take some thin wire, in this case 24 gauge, bend it, and use it to hook onto this part. I might want to make the this part smaller so it's easier to unhook once I'm done. And then that will go through. Make sure it doesn't go loose. Plunger goes. And then over here, we can pull this back to the outside. Actually, first, let's get this guy back in. So, this way in, lamped hole is at the bottom, interface with that pin over there, this guy. Just make sure it's resting like that. Then we want to get this guy back in, in this direction. And once we're sufficiently in, we can pull the spring back out. Might as well do it that way so that we minimize the work required to get that screw in. Yeah, that's gonna be a pain. So, yeah, do I? The only thing I can advise is having good tweezers. You can remove the screws for this rear piece here. If you want to be able to make some more space to maneuver tools for reinstalling that screw over there. So I've devised a rather exotic technique. Basically, I used my little wire hook to first pull the spring up to the rim. And with that, I get enough space to try to get the screw through the hole first. There you go. And with that, should be a lot easier for me to maneuver the tip into the respective screw hole and then remove this wire hook. Or if you're lucky, after getting to that state, you'll be able to maneuver it such that it already gets stuck in the screwable position, like so. Excellent. 
Okay, so now that the plunger spring is reinstalled, we can put these springs back in. So, that guy, and this guy. Then we will need to scooch this guy over a bit just enough so we can get this plate back in. Then all we need to do is put the screws back on this guy and put the rear plate back in. Now before closing up I want to address one adjustment that I did have to do when I received this pair of pliers. Um, in fact it seems that the mere act of disassembling and reassembling it has brought about the exact same issue. So basically what was happening was so in our this year is our key ring removal state, and this is our key ring reinstallment state. But as you can see, that the back of that pin there is not being lowered low enough. So to fix that, we have to get at these two screws there and adjust the height of this assembly here with respect to this hole. Um, so to do that, I'm going to remove these screws first. So that comes right off. And basically, we want this guy to be a bit lower. So to do that, we have to carefully loosen these two screws and lower this a bit. When reinstalling it, make sure that this tab here goes into that gap right there. Okay, it's all fixed now. So now that's working reliably. Uh, sometimes it doesn't return well. Pressing on that engages the key pulling mode. Okay, but yeah, um, you might not always get it right the first time, so it might be a bit of back and forth trial and error unscrewing and rescrewing these. Uh, so, you know, this just goes back on. There you go. And we have our last screw. Alright, that's it for the wonderful Joystick Universal Keyring Pliers, for which with one tool, you can both remove and reinstall key rings of any diameter. Now, considering that Charles Gu currently produces the pairs of conventional removal and reinstallation key ring pliers for around $400, all hand machined, um, you can only imagine what it would be like to have reproductions of this particular model. Um, number one, um, I mean, technically has more parts, but again, you get everything in one convenient and highly versatile package. Um, so, yeah, if any of you out there are looking to machine and produce your own versions of this model, do get in contact with me. Alright, so again, if you found this content here interesting, given that, if you found this video interesting and would like to see more typewriter content, feel free to like and subscribe.